Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Harry Croft. Um, some of you will remember me from the old television days, The Mind is Powerful Medicine. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease. Now, this isn't a formal lecture. This is just a general overview, and I hope it might answer some of the questions that you may have, and, and it may acquaint you with some of the studies we're doing here at Clinical Trials of Texas. Uh, my job now is Chief of Central Nervous System Research here at uh, Clinical Trials of Texas, also known as saresearch.com. So let's start with what is Alzheimer's disease? Uh, that's probably a question that many people have, but before they get to that, their personal worry is, do I have Alzheimer's disease? You know, I'm a little forgetful. I can't remember where I put my keys. I can't remember where I left my wallet. Do I have Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is, well, maybe, but it may not be Alzheimer's disease at all. Because you see, all of us, as we get older, get a little more forgetful. We call that benign uh, memory loss. Uh, scientifically, people develop some benign memory loss as they age. And frankly, it's not a big deal if you forget uh, your keys sometime or, or you forget where you put your car in the parking lot or where you left your wallet, that may not be anything abnormal. That just may be a sign of aging. If, on the other hand, it starts happening very frequently and you put your keys in unusual places, for example, you put your keys in the refrigerator or you can't remember uh, what your car looks like. That's a whole different story, and that's something that, that we may want to worry about. So how do we start? Well, you can look up online, and an especially good place to look is the Alzheimer's Disease Organization, ALZ.org. They have a lot of great information. We have a lot of great information right here on our website at saresearch.com, but get information, and that may make you feel better that your memory loss is perhaps not a big deal, it's just aging. If you think there may be a problem, one of the things we're offering here is free memory screenings. So the way we do a memory screen is it's a pen and paper test that people take, and it comes out with a number. And if your number is below a certain level, that may indicate that you may have a memory problem. The, the memory problem without any other issues going along with it that I'll discuss in a second is called mild cognitive impairment. If, in fact, it gets to the place where your memory loss and other symptoms, perhaps it might be difficulty finding words, maybe it, it might be uh, difficulty finding things in your home, maybe it's difficulty leaving uh, the water running or leaving the stove on, are not remembering quite or being able to prepare breakfast. Uh, all those things may be an indicator that it's more than just mild cognitive impairment. Now it may be what we call dementia. And that's memory loss plus some other problem that begins to interfere with day-to-day -day functioning. That is, it's more than just the memory problem. Now the memory problem plus the language problem plus recognition problems plus some of the other things I mentioned may be an indicator that this is dementia. Now, dementia means memory problems plus the other uh, difficulties with thinking uh, that, that may go along with it that interferes with day-to-day -day functioning. Dementia is not Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
it may be Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. In fact, two out of three folks with dementia suffer from their dementia because of their Alzheimer's, but there are other problems that can cause dementia as well. That's a little more advanced than uh, this session, uh, but Alzheimer's disease is the, the most common cause of dementia, and, and unfortunately, it's a very common illness these days. It's estimated that some five million people in the United States now suffer from Alzheimer's. Now, uh, that's scary enough, but it's estimated that by the year 2050, that number will triple. And of the 10 leading causes of death, only Alzheimer's disease is increasing in frequency, and it's only Alzheimer's disease for which we have no cure yet. So what we're doing here at uh, Clinical Trials of Texas is looking for, for new compounds that may help with Alzheimer's disease. We know that Alzheimer's disease itself begins some 10 to 15 years before the real symptoms show up. And so our hope is that maybe through research, we can come up with new products that may prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, right now, we're looking for folks with mild memory problems or those who have early dementia and are already on medications to see if we can do something to prevent the worsening of their disease. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, and in future sessions here on Facebook, we'll look into the rest of the story. But right now, if you have questions, we would love to hear from you. You can call the number here on Facebook to get more information or to see if you might qualify or a relative of yours might qualify to be in one of our research studies. So thank you for listening today, and following this, we're going to have Dr. Jason Miller talking about another disease state that we're doing research for here at Clinical Trials of Texas, and that's adolescent depression. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Dr. Harry Croft. As time rolls by, our minds become more vulnerable to memory loss. By scheduling a memory loss screen today, you will take an important step in planning for your long-term care. So what are the benefits of a memory loss screen? Memory loss screens are done on a scale and your score will show your degree of memory loss. Depending on your score, your fears may be alleviated for the time being. But even if your score shows a reason for concern, remember there may be reasons for short-term memory impairment including diet and exercise, medication side effects, or even depression. Again, these are factors that could be impairing your memory, but on the short term. If further testing shows that you may be experiencing long-term memory loss, you and your family can begin to plan for medical, legal, and financial concerns for the future. This is also the best time to consider participating in a clinical trial. A memory loss screen in our office takes about one hour, and then you can get back to the rest of your life. We'll see how it goes.
Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Miller. I'm a physician with Clinical Trials of Texas. I'm a psychiatrist and a family practitioner. Uh, and currently, we're working on a study looking at teenage depression. Uh, interestingly about teenage depression, uh, when we think about teenagers, we think about kids who are uh, developmentally, they're arriving at their identity, they're having thoughts about who they're going to be for the rest of their lives, and probably not surprising to any parents out there, they're moody. Uh, they are sometimes rebellious, they sometimes can cause some difficulty in the family, uh, and that's all pretty normal behavior. And if you're a parent, you've often wondered, you know, what's the line that they have to cross before it goes from what we think of it being kind of regular teenage behavior versus something else? Uh, at what point are we thinking about something like depression? Uh, so the first thing to know is that teenage depression is actually really pretty common. Uh, it turns out that it affects one in 10 teenagers and that, uh, in fact, uh, one in four teenagers will experience up to mild symptoms of depression that's different than the t regular kind of teenage angst or teenage sorts of uh, moodiness that we might think is a normal state for teenagers. The consequence of that is uh, that at times parents will seek treatment. It turns out, however, that the treatments that are available for adults aren't available for teenagers and children. Uh, as a result of a lot of studies, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny about the treatment of teenagers and children that's very different than for adults. The FDA now requires that we do a lot more studies to make certain that medications are safe uh, and effective for teenagers and children, and well they should because we know that teenagers and children aren't just small adults. Uh, they are, in, they're in fact got different physiology, different brain chemistry that makes things very different for them. Um, when you think about teenagers then, uh, what you'd wonder about is, gosh, if I take them to treatment, uh, what's going to happen? And unfortunately, the studies right now show that a lot of teenagers are undertreated, probably because there's not a lot of drugs that are available for their treatment right now. Um, and when they look at it in large groups of people, what they find is that only about two-thirds of, of teenagers who suffer from depression actually get treated. And of that group, uh, greater than half of them never receive any follow-up treatment. So they might make it to their family practitioner or to a psychiatrist, but then after that, for a variety of reasons, they just don't make it a, to any sort of a follow-up. Uh, so as a consequence, a lot of teenagers go untreated who have depression, despite it being a very common uh, thing that teenagers uh, find themselves struggling with. When you think about teenagers versus adults in terms of their depressive symptoms, uh, one of the truths, again, is that teenagers aren't just small adults. Uh, when we think of adults who have depression, we think of people who are down, sad, uh, maybe have trouble sleeping. They look depressed. They look sad and down. With a teenager, they may present very differently. Uh, so, an example of, so some examples of this. Uh, so a teenager, as opposed to perhaps the what we think of it being the typical depressive symptom of waking up really early because you've got so much on your mind, a teenager may in fact stay up all night and then they sleep all day. Uh, again, this is one of those things where sometimes teenagers do this because they're just challenging their limits, uh, but the, the line that you draw is that when this becomes a behavior that's affecting their everyday life in such a way that they're having trouble uh, accomplishing the tasks and goals that they've set out for themselves. Also, uh, with teenagers, changes in behavior that, again, sometimes can look like regular teenage behavior, uh, when they become extreme, you start to wonder about depression. So another example of this would be kind of thoughts about death or dying, not necessarily suicide, but thoughts that are of a darker nature might be a warning sign of depression. Other things that you may notice are uh, teenagers may suddenly have a decline in school performance. Uh, while grades for kids a lot of times go up and down, uh, if it's prolonged, especially if there's not a good reason for it, uh, again, suspecting depression could be there. They can also find themselves more irritable than normal. Again, teenagers can be irritable, that can be normal. Uh, however, uh, if the irritability is prolonged, if it's of a particularly negative sort, uh, if they find that if you find that they are uh, particularly prone to getting irritable if critiqued in any ways or made to feel uh, as though that they're being attacked in some way, uh, then again, might be a, a worry sign for depression. Uh, of course, parents always worry about signs of suicide. And with kids, they, the thing to look out for are big changes in behavior. 
So one of the things that you could notice uh, that would be obvious would be a kid who's been a, a good rule follower, somebody who's not been in trouble, and suddenly you find that they're either using drugs or they're getting into some sort of criminal mischief. Uh, we worry about drug use in teenagers anyways, but sometimes the drug use can be a symptom of depression. Uh, another thing that teenagers can suffer with is having inappropriate guilt. So uh, kind of these worrisome thoughts that they're to blame for all their troubles. Uh, while that's not an unusual symptom in adult depression, with teenagers it can also be the reverse. They can worry that other people are doing this to them. Uh, not paranoia, but what they are is actually kind of blaming others for their current symptoms and their current situation. The other thing that you can see with teenagers is a loss of concentration. So uh, these aren't people with ADHD or attention deficit disorder. Uh, these are people who, because of their mood change, they suddenly have trouble with their memory, with their ability to concentrate. And as a consequence, sometimes of that, uh, you'll see a decline in uh, school performance or work performance. The other thing that you can notice with teenagers is it's normal developmentally for teenagers uh, to be very bonded to their peers, uh, to have a peer group that they may actually relate to more than their family. Uh, and while that can create some problems with the family dynamic, it's a pretty normal thing for teenagers to go through. In depression, you may notice them starting to pull back from their friends. Uh, they're not as interested in doing things with their friends. Uh, they may actually create excuses or reasons to not go out, um, to maybe not even go on dates, uh, which again would be a very unusual thing and can be a warning sign for depression. At Clinical Trials of Texas right now, we're doing a study looking at an agent that's already been approved for adults uh, that we're trying to find out if it's going to work well in teenagers and, and children. The FDA requires extra study again because we want to make certain that these medications are safe and that they work well for teenagers and children. And so as a consequence, we've started enrolling patients right now. If you have interest uh, in talking about your teenager's behavior, even in just getting a, a, an evaluation. Um, studies are always voluntary. If you want to come in, have the evaluation, you want to talk to a professional about this, we're happy to do that. Uh, and even if you ultimately decide that you don't want to participate in the trial itself, you can get an awful lot of information. We do pretty in-depth testing uh, involving a number of uh, very, in, uh, very good and useful scales that we look at behavior that give us a pretty valid way of looking at whether or not a teenager or a child is suffering from depression. Uh, with trials, uh, there is some time commitment to that, um, but one again, once again, one of the things that we know is that teenagers, unfortunately, in our current population are undertreated. So what we're really offering for people is uh, not only will you not be undertreated, um, but we're really going to go above and beyond. There's a lot of follow-up that takes place, uh, which is uh, a lot more than you would even get from a psychiatrist or, a, or even a very good family practitioner. And as a consequence, anybody who's interested, please call our number. We'll be happy to take any of your questions. Uh, even if you don't know if your teenager is depressed or if they've never been to see a doctor about it, we'd be happy to talk with you about it. Uh, once again, my name is Jason Miller. I work with Clinical Trials of Texas. Thank you for listening today. We'd be happy to field any questions you might have.